it made no sense to give it up and go become a surfer on a beach. I think it's about emotions and we can make the calculated risks. We can, we can crunch the numbers. We can try to use logic as much as possible, but there's this human element. There's this emotional element that if you're not fulfilled, that to me is the biggest risk of all. And I was not fulfilled. So how do you view this fight and this pull versus the long game? and then the short and fast immediate game, especially in the lanes of healing as we've been talking about. I think the short, fast, immediate changes are attractive. To me, they're booby traps. They're booby traps because short changes are not about integration. The long game is about integration. I am no longer interested in helping somebody feel better today. Great if it does, tremendously successful if some of the movements I show you, based on what we know about physiology and psychology, they could create a tremendous immediate change for you right now. If that happens, wonderful. But I don't want you to come here looking for a change right now. I want you to come to my system because you want the start of next year to be better than you are right now. I want you to think about what you want to live life like in five years, and that's why you come to my system. I am so adverse to the messaging, the quick fixes. We can fix your body in X amount of sessions. With only five minutes a day, you can do that. It, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work in the way people want it to work. And the more these quick fix changes are out there, the harder it is to talk about the long game and for people to actually commit and surrender themselves to a practice that evolves over time. I cannot tell you how many people have come to my system, did not get out of pain in two weeks or 30 days like they wanted to be, quit and came back years later to only actually commit to themselves and get the change in a couple months. I think the fastest way to feeling better is by playing the long game. I think you will feel better and you will feel better faster by looking at and committing to a practice that will take time to learn rather than looking for the sporadic changes here or there that keep you in this very fluctuating up and down cycle of you starting and stopping and starting and quitting over and over and over again. The fastest way to get better is to be consistent long-term. That's what the body adapts to best, not short changes. I think the trick is understanding that our nervous system can adapt very quickly. You said it in, in a sentence our brain could literally start changing our perspective that we've held on to so tightly for years. A single exercise or a movement could radically change how our nervous system adapts or feels, but it takes weeks and weeks of integration for the nervous system to start changing our muscular system. And it takes months of consistent cueing for our muscular system and nervous system to start changing the other soft tissue structures like fascia, tendons, and ligaments. Fast changes will always yield towards nervous system results. But if we want to truly change our capacity to move, that can only be done over long-term application when our soft tissue changes. So I'm, I'm a long game fan. It's all I communicate towards. Every piece of marketing that we do has nothing to do with, let's fix your back pain in five minutes or pain-free system in 30 days. It's garbage. It's the quickest way that any consumer can look towards a red flag with any therapeutic modality. I've built my business on the long game, so much so that, that even my guarantee, it's a 90-day guarantee, not saying you're going to feel better in 90 days, that would be a preposterous claim to make, but you should feel like you're on the right track in 90 days. You should feel like things are making sense and the road towards healing is a little bit more clear than it is now. You should feel like you have confidence in my system within 90 days, or I'm gonna give you your money back. There's no such thing as promising results, but you can promise a process. And that's what the long game is, is a process that somebody can dedicate themselves to that will give them the results that they want long-term. That's what this is about. Yeah, your enthusiasm and passion and conviction in this long game shines through the screen, right? So I appreciate that TED Talk, Vinny. Um, I, I say that because we riffed about this last time, even the long-form podcast 
any long game in any avenue nowadays is a dying art, period. And it's so hard to fight against algorithms and what people are seeking, sound bites versus in-depth knowledge. And even your captions are very elaborative on Instagram, very, very long and in-depth captions, which I appreciate, but I know I'm sure you lose some fans along the way, but you attract the ones who are aligned and intentional about healing and what it entails. So I want to stay on this train in terms of helping clients. You helped over 4,000 clients in terms of their physical, emotional reconciliations, in terms of their healing, which is an incredible amount to say it out loud, because I think nowadays people get desensitized to numbers, right? They're like, oh, 4,000, few hundred, uh, whatever, uh, no big deal. It's like 4,000 humans is wild. So can you share a few highlight stories that some of the most or your favorite success stories from your client work that happened and transpired once they shifted from short game mindset to the long game mindset? So first of all, I do not consider a change within the first year because that's a quick fix. That's a quick change. When I say 4,000 lives changed, we are talking about 4,000 integrations of lives changed. We are talking about 4,000 people developing a movement practice beyond a year, not joining the program, their knee hurt, and now two weeks later, their knee doesn't hurt. That doesn't count. Getting out of pain is the first step of what I teach. Staying pain-free, changing your relationship to pain, and mastering and developing a movement system, that is a life truly changed. And that's what it takes for me to count a life changed. One of my favorite testimonials, one of my favorite cases. Her name is Samantha. She actually just graduated from a PhD program in psychology in, in Australia. She joined our program and was consistent for 13 months, every single day. No real change. One of the more severe cases of scoliosis, her pelvis on her right side was elevated close to three inches. You could see the, the curvature, the scoliotic curves so uh, clearly from the back. She would take progress photos every few weeks. She would document in a journal. She was a highly involved student that saw zero change for 13 months. And then month 14 happened and her body changed so radically fast. It was unbelievable. Her progress photos are some of the most commonly shared or most frequently used photos that I share. And I talk about her story often because she joined not expecting to heal her scoliosis in 30 days. When you commit to a process, doesn't matter if you see results in 13 months, who cares? You've lived like this for 30 years. What 13 months is, is a drop in the bucket. She committed to making a change in her life at month 14 was when her entire physiology actually started to soften and adapt to the movement she was doing. She is almost completely reversed what was about a, I might misquote this, it was definitely above a 30 degree curvature. It might have been in the mid 40s, has been almost nearly reduced to sub 10 degrees. It's the in between her photos that makes her one of my favorite testimonials, my favorite case study, because of the work that it takes to make these changes. Even though she worked hard for 13 months and didn't see any change, and from month 13 to month 14, that 30-day window, she saw an incredible amount of change. It didn't take her 30 days to make a change. It took 14 months to make a change. This was three or four years ago. So she is now closing up on year four or entering year five, and she's still just as dedicated and committed. Long after the result was achieved, there was no destination mindset. I'm going to fix my scoliosis. I'm going to correct it so I can go back to living life the way I was. We are talking about a successful integration towards after having gotten the results she want, five, five years later, she's still doing the same work every day. That is a beautiful, perfect example of the long game. Man, that's a uh, because once again, consistency is a shining theme, but another trope, right? At the same time, it's not just about showing up when you feel like you're showing up on the easy day. It's about showing up when it's the hardest, when it's dark out, when you already feel like you're dealing with the acceptable amount of success, but you're still showing up. 
that's a consistency that everyone talks about. And it's really hard because for any habit to withstand the iteration of time, day in and day out, that takes so much emotional, physical, mental commitment. And really a shout out to Samantha for the successes. And I'm sure her pursuit of PhD in psychology has something to deal with her pain and her conditions, right? Yeah, and, and I wanna even tie in, tie in the addiction, the sabotage. Your greatest expectations are gonna be in your first couple months, which is probably gonna be the darkest time when th- you're not coming to me when you feel your best, you're coming to me because you've had enough of feeling your worst and you wanna make a change. In those first 90 days, you are going to place the highest expectation on results spontaneously and magically happening. Your expectations are gonna be through the roof. And if you can learn to understand that you need to show up regardless of results, detach yourself from outcomes, you are here to be better in five years. You are here to play with your grandkids in 10 or 20 years. That's what this is about. If you can can look at your consistency is not predicated on results, you are going to shed yourself of maybe being addicted to pain. Because whether it's there or not, you're still doing your stuff. You're not allowing sensation to sabotage your results. You are not allowing a physical pain to determine the way you're going to live life. You yourself are taking control and you are learning how to show up, whether you're feeling amazing or not at all. Through the highs and the lows, you are dedicated to showing up every single day. And until that happens, not much changes. Because if we don't show up every day, what really happens is we show up when it's convenient. It's only when that pain signal is blaring will we make time to do our exercises. And the main fallacy with that, the problem is, is when you feel good, you stop doing the same work that got you good. If your goal is to lose five pounds, as soon as you lose those five pounds, you're probably right back to the diet that had those extra five pounds there in the first place. But if you're committed to living as healthy and as long and thrive as long as possible, you're not The scale doesn't change you. It does not change your habits. Your pain levels do not change your habits. If we can look at developing the habit of being consistent as your main goal, it's just a matter of time until that you get the change you want. I think it's often just that simple. Yeah, and then is that the same way you view your healing journey that took you 13 years, and now you're finally on the other side, looking at the other side of how much and how far you've come, right? Yeah, and it's, I say it now with passion and confidence because I've walked that walk. I know what's on the other side of that fence. When I was in it though, it was just an entirely different story because I knew about consistency. I was an athlete and I knew you had to show up. I knew you had to put in hard work. I wasn't connected to the problem and I wasn't really willing to face the fact that I don't know if I actually believed I could get better. I kind of accepted disability. My belief wasn't there. My commitment wasn't there. And because of that, nothing really changed for a long time. I'm gonna be the first person to say, I have started and quit more times than I can even count on with the the method I teach right now. I have quit that so many times because of my misplaced expectations and me not understanding that this is really about the long game. As soon as I made that switch and I said, you know what, screw the outcomes. I want something to practice daily. I want to work. I need to feel like as a human being, I'm working towards something. It wasn't until I had that hard conversation with myself. I haven't done this for 30 days. I haven't done it for 60 days. I haven't even done it for 90 days. And I'm telling people to be consistent. What do I know about consistency? Until I actually lived into that, that's when the magic really started happening. And I view not just your work, Vinny, but a lot of healers and practitioners, their work, whether you're physicians or not, It's a spider web. It's this interconnectivity, right? Because when you heal and when you allow one person's path to be corrected through this movement exercise or your program, you're not just helping that person. You're affecting directly that person's family, friends, partners, spouses, children. And so in reality, you didn't just help 4,000 people through integration that you alluded to that you put high emphasis on, but you also allowed the healing to spill over and for that person to show up to his or her, their meant and their predestined capacity as a person to their own network. And that's why it's powerful because that's why I talk about for everyone, cultivate self-awareness, period. 
Otherwise, we're just 8 billion individual trigger points walking around and navigating this complexity of life by constantly being triggered or triggering other people. The other thing is seek help because by you receiving help that we talked about, you're not just helping yourself. You're helping other one, the ones they love about you and the ones that you love. And I share that because it's not, I don't believe in good or bad. I believe in serving or disserving. I share that because everyone has different level of genetic variations. For an athlete like you are, Vinny, on the elite level, you are predisposed to a certain level of threshold for grit, for consistency, for perseverance, whatever. These are all genetic markers. Some people may not have the genetic makeup that you do, Vinny. So maybe they need some more encouraging in terms of, okay, maybe I won't be able to show up for myself every day. But how about, can you show up for your mother? Can you show up for your partner? Can you show up for your kid? Just like you did for your son when you're dealing with aloofness caused by the narcotics and opiates you're taking. And once again, of course, someone could say, well, Benoit, but then if you're doing this for someone else, it's not sustainable. Well, it could be and could be not. We don't know. But for that person, at least understand that healing is not just for you. Healing affects everyone that you love and vice versa. I think if you have stable people in your life, like a spouse, kids, parents, right? Not not fleeting friends that might come and go. Doing something for someone else is often the biggest catalyst of change that we can make. I talked about earlier that I didn't understand how much my mind and emotions had to do with this healing process until I had my first psychotherapy session. And I got asked questions I didn't know how to answer. I didn't have answers for them. And some of these questions were, how is your disability affecting the loved ones around you? And I'm, I'm almost going to get teary-eyed thinking about that because I didn't think about that. I didn't think about, I thought I was only hurting myself by quitting and by not being consistent, by not really trying. I paid people, but I didn't really do the work. I didn't really once in eight years think about how is this impacting the people I love most. And I love people a lot. And I was unable to see the impact that this was making. Not pushing my kid on a swing, he's not going to have those memories as a kid. Not playing ball or catch with him, not being intimate with my wife because I'm in agonizing pain. Everybody else around me was suffering in some way, shape, or form because I wasn't showing up to life fully. And I was showing up less than I knew I could. And I was playing it safe as hell. My addiction didn't change until I saw the way my son was looking at me when he needed me. I changed for him. I would not have had the power to do it myself. If I could have, I would have. Maybe some people can. And I don't relate to those people because I've never done something just for the sake of myself. It's always been in service of others. So that's, that's how I think I'm wired. But I think it takes others and seeing others clearly that can inspire so much change in us. This might go down a totally uh, different rabbit hole here, but you know, Homo sapiens, mankind, we are not the first species of Homo. There have been a variety of other species. Why we have predominated over them was not due to our physical power or intelligence. They were all of similar intelligence and physical capacity. Maybe they had Neanderthals, had different size and strength to them. What made us succeed was our ability to live in large groups. Neanderthal camp size villages were not found with more than 50 people. It was always 50 people or less. Homo sapiens had cultures and villages of hundreds of people. We were able, we are wired to work as a team. We are significantly more successful when we collaborate and work with others. So if you want to make a change, if you want to heal, let's look at how it's impacting others around you and see if that camaraderie and community can be enough to actually make a change. It's when I felt alone and isolated and alienated, that's when the worst healing was. That's when the least results happened. It wasn't until the community started becoming clear around me that I actually pulled the power from that and made a change. We're wired for it. If we can lean into that, I think many, many great things are possible. It's like you literally stole what I was thinking. I, I shit you not, I was in the exact same frequency because I was going to talk about the role of sociality that played for human development. Of course, there's a, a host of different contributing factors and variables to why Homo sapiens became the most apex predator in the pyramid. 
but one of the proven study is the acquisition of language is what allowed us to humans to develop our emotionality this this concurrent ability to think of us as individual person and also as a collective being humans are the few species that are capable of that a lot of mammals are but we're the animals with the largest uh, we're the mammals with the largest brain and that sociality or this acquisition of language is rooted in sociality that we are social animals and of course a lot of introverts may disagree because a lot of them are saying about like oh i just want to live on an island i don't need no interactions and of course you'll succeed deep inside we are all interconnected to other people that's why i'm christian by faith but i'm spiritual by trait because i believe in the philosophy of oneness and we have to work with each other and life is infinitely better when you do that too right um but it's funny you said that because i was literally thinking about sociality and that indeniable or indisputable role it played in terms of what made humans the way we are today my wife and i we have we don't watch a lot of tv but there is one reality show that we cannot get enough of it's called alone have you seen it oh, i've heard of it it's you know putting these sometimes 10 men and women highly capable they're not random people they're they're very proficient skill sets at surviving in the wild on their own they're put in these isolated locations like patagonia or vancouver island and their job is to survive with only 10 tools and they build shelters. Some of them built a spa, tanning. I mean, they, they build these elaborate structures. They're able to feed themselves. It's a tough life, but it's not the tough life that breaks them. It's being alone that breaks them. It's the missing others that breaks them. So I know people can be solitary. I know they can survive and make do by themselves, but we're wired to be really well and work really well together. It's a part of our biopsychology. Yeah. Biopsycho, social, spiritual, right? So for anyone want to read more about this, as always, we're the vehicle for information and resources. That's why it's called Discover More. So you can discover more after the episode. So it's called uh, just Map of Emotions. And if you go down to the root cause of depression, it's actually isolations and loneliness. They're on the same uh, spectrum. And yeah, I think that itself is enough, right? And another famous mental health adage the opposite of expression is depression. What you don't express gets depressed. And expression requires another person or another human. Love to keep going down this road, but there's so much I want to cover and ask you more about. Uh, but yeah, just don't forget that why we became the apex predators today is not because of our incredible strength or intelligence, uh, because we don't quite understand why our brains became this size uh, out of nowhere. But sociality is a root contributing factor to that. Yeah, I want to take a slight pivot into the more personal and business background because we've dedicated in terms of healing what you do with your work and your own genesis story and how you deal with pain now versus then. I want to talk about calculator risk with you, Vinny, because I feel like you have something a lot to say about that. Maybe not. I share that because you dropped out of your D1 college commitment for swimming because you're a D1 athlete. I'm not sure if you had a full right, but I believe you did, um, to come out to California at age 18, as you said, to pursue this path of being a professional surfer, because water has always been a safe haven and sanctuary for you, despite you being jaded and swimming specifically. How do you view calculated risk in life? And why do you think uh, it's important for everyone, uh, whether they want to take a calculated risk, air quote, to try your program, despite their skepticism? or for anyone that want to try something new or venture into whatever field? I'm a very intuitive person, and it made no sense to leave a Division I program, university, University of Wyoming, great program, great school, very straightforward path to getting a degree and, and being successful with whatever field I would have chosen. It made no sense to give it up and go become a surfer on a beach. I think it's about emotions and we can make the calculated risk. We can, we can crunch the numbers. We can try to use logic as much as possible, but there's this human element. There's this emotional element that if you're not fulfilled, that to me is the biggest risk of all. And I was not fulfilled. And that to me was the greatest risk. I had seen my parents follow the very calculated path they reduced a lot of risk. They did exactly what you should do, the responsible things, the um, how you provide for family. It's always the safe options. And 
they were miserable. They hated it. They were working jobs they they couldn't stand. I saw it every day at school. People were studying things that they couldn't care anything about. And here we are sacrificing so much time, money, energy, and youth for things that don't light us up. What are we doing here? And it was this, I think the University of Wyoming was the perfect environment to see that. There wasn't a lot of fulfillment up there that I saw. There wasn't a lot of enjoyment. It was a lot of cold. It was very windy and it was very miserable. People were doing things that they just had to go through the most emotions. Conversations were dull. Social experiences were dull. There was nothing enriching about the environment. To me, it would have been more risky to stay there than it would have been to actually leave to California and pursue what what made me feel fulfilled. So it's a tough thing. Uh, The calculated risk of should you spend the money and do my program or continue living life the same? I'm a firm believer that nothing changes if nothing changes. Don't know who said it, I know it was a quote. I did not make that up. That is not mine, but I use it often. You could stay the same and if and if that's secure for you and that's what you want, then then there is no risk. But I think the risk is always staying the same. I think we're designed to grow. And I've had the growth mentality ever since I was a little kid. I feel uncomfortable being stagnant. So if you want to make a change, it's it's riskier to not do a movement program and learn about yourself, educate yourself, increase your awareness. Grow your capacity to be a functional, capable human being and watch what happens. We don't even know the things that we say no to when we don't take risks. We can see the the risks maybe in front of us, but we don't even know the things on the other side of them that we're saying no to. The friends, the people, places, jobs, relationships, it's all on the other side of saying yes. So I've become a yes man because I've realized the power of not arguing to keep my limitations. And of course, the nuances are some people need to say yes more and some people need to say yes less, <laughs> right? And there is that too. Yeah, yeah. There, You can say yes too much. Sometimes you got to say no. And and that's that's what I'm learning also is not everything needs to be a hell yes. There can also be no's and feeling okay in telling people no and situations no. That's that's another childhood wound that I'm learning how to how to how to heal and work through. Yeah, I'll just bill you for this therapy session afterwards. And you can yeah, just- thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. This this feel I feel good. I feel empowered here. The uh, another quote that reminds me of uh, once again, I don't know who is this attributable to, but something about when anyone is at a decision making point, people like to measure the downsides which you're going to lose against that decision, and you forget to take calculations of what you're going to gain on the other side, because people like to think from this place of fear and scarcity. And people like to view decision making as only downside. It's like, no, sure, you may lose some. I don't know about your life or circumstances, but you may also gain something. As Eleanor Roosevelt said best, everything you desire is on the other side of fear. Right? As you can tell, I love quotes. Um, I'm sure I misattributed a few, but once again, there's a lot of truth. And my favorite channel on YouTube is called Yes Theory because it talks about the life's possibilities, the endless possibilities that await on the other side once you have the courage to say yes to. If you're not used to saying yes too much, right? of course, there's the nuances. But honestly, life is empowering that way if you say yes to the right opportunities. You know, one of the, the costs of my program is for the first two months, I ask people spend 15 to 25 minutes a day to get into the habit of choosing themselves and spending time for themselves, which can be a very big ask if you're not used to spending any time working on yourself, body, or movement. And as the program starts to become custom tailored to the movements and exercises that make the biggest change in your body, my ask jumps up to 45 minutes, then to an hour. And for people on the outside, spending an hour a day, that's a huge cost. That's a huge, that means it's less TV, it's less whatever they're doing. I think the the thing that is always not in view is, well, what else happens when you do that? When you spend an hour of your day, what is that feeling like of being able to literally go do what you want, how hard you want, when you want, where you want? What's that feel, what is that worth to you? And there are people who see that exchange of time and value that it's it's an easy decision to make. For others, it's too big of an ask. It's too big of an ask to make. And and the risk is too high. 
because uh, they, they don't want to spend that time every day to work on their self or develop things. And I kind of am rambling, but I'll bring it back full circle. It goes back to the instant gratification part. If you just want the five minute stuff a day, you're going to be, you're going to continue looking for those five minute a day uh, solutions rather than what is the thing, what, what's the work that you can put in now to live the life that you want later. Yeah, I want to make this weird connection, but it reminds me of meditation. It's a book, uh, Emily Fletcher, she's a prolific meditation teacher in New York City. Uh, she wrote this book, I forgot the name of the book, but she talks about or her pitch to people who resist to meditation with the statement of, I'm too busy. She asks, if you can dedicate 2% of your time to improve the 98% of your life, would you do it? 2% to improve the 98%, would you do it? And most people would say yes. And that's exactly what you're saying, Vinny, is that trade-off is perceived as such. But do that, if you want to do that math, let's truly quantify everything. Is are you willing to put down 2% of effort every single day to dramatically improve 98% of not just your effort, but your life? Would you optimize that? And that's and I feel like it's the perfect thing to share here because that's how I view meditation, that's how I view mental health therapy, that's how I view your work is do the work and you will get the magic you're seeking. When you frame it like that, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. I'm going to pull that from the show and start putting that in the conversations because it, it, it makes, you know, when you just talk about doing 30 minutes to an hour a day, it feels like a tall order, but we're not thinking about the other 23 hours and what it does to those. Uh, let's keep going down this train of your personal life. And I want to talk about this when you said the University of My Wyoming how do you view this dichotomy of formal education versus informal, aka pursuing knowledge for the joy and the fulfillment and the passion of it? Formal education felt like a prison, for lack of better words. It felt like a sentence that had to be paid every day. That's what school was to me. I was always taught what to think. I was never taught how to think or why to think this way. And it wasn't until I broke away from formal education did my understanding and my interest actually peak. And I started finding things to pursue that I was passionate about. I've got a wall of credentials and certifications from formal institutes like uh, Agoski University, Stanford School of Medicine, National Academy of Sports Medicine. These are all very practical. Uh, Great, great formats for education. But the things that I do and teach are from how I've come to understand the world, not what I learned in those textbooks. So formal education and I don't get along well. I have very adverse reactions to it, not to discredit that or to look down on it. It is really important that licensed professionals are all uniformly taught what the current education and understanding is. But in that same breath, we need to be taught how to be critical of that, what's being taught. And that was not being present in formal education. There was no criticism of the textbooks. It was learn the textbook. This is right. This is what you're going to be tested on. Not who wrote these textbooks? What are their viewpoints on the world? And can we have another historical textbook on somebody who maybe isn't of this demographic? What do they say about history? What are the archaeological finds that are important to them that have shaped their view of, of modern, uh, modern civilization? There was no learning how to inquire sources. It was just Here's the information, learn it. And I had to break that really poor habit getting into helping people with their health. I had only learned how to read the bottom line conclusion of studies, not really taught how did they get to this conclusion. Let's look beyond the abstract. Who are the people doing the studies? What do they believe? What is their background in education? What do I dislike about the study? What did they do well and what did they not do well? These are the things that I was not taught in formal education that I had to learn the hard way. Maybe it was the institutions and schools that I went to didn't teach this. Maybe others out there with formal education saying, what do you mean? That's exactly what we were taught. It's, it, it wasn't my experience in formal education. The key point that we're talking about now is the power or the process of vetting. A very simple way to identify and parse through hosts and plethora of researches and studies out there 
Well, first of all, make sure it's peer reviewed, period. That's a great starting point. And then look at the abstract to see how many complex and jargons are used in that abstract. The more it is, avoid that. That means the author or the authors don't have great commands over the knowledge or the studies because the best scientists and best teachers can simplify language. And that's something I'm working on a lot and it's trying to avoid jargon because jargon is often more self-gratifying than provides benefits for the readers. That's two points. The third thing is, as Vinny alluded to briefly, look at the conclusion and look at the shortcomings of that study. If a peer review research does not have an in-depth portion where it talks about the shortcomings of this trial or study, avoid it because there's a lot of biases, confirmation bias, normacy bias, groupthink bias, on and on. The last thing is what Vinny said. Go into each author's name and look them up to see what sort of a corporate or biased interest do they carry, and B, are they even credible as a researcher, as an author of this study? For example, if let's say Vinny, and Vinny has a research publications about movements or pain, and that, that, that's what the article is about, yet his background is in depressions or anxiety or something that's sort of related, but not really, avoid that because the person is not an expert in the subject. Yeah, I am going to pull this from, from Neil deGrasse Tyson because I love the way that man thinks. Famous astrophysicist, or I guess as famous as an astrophysicist can be. He ran a master class on how to think. And he uses the scientific method to talk about science is designed, a great study is designed to A, be understandable to everybody, and B, simple enough to replicate that somebody else could redo the study and get the same results. Good science is multiple studies showing the same thing and moving us closer to a place of certainty. What I'm seeing nowadays, the information that's out there, people are pulling information from one study and that is now a part of their core belief system. And there is no vetting of Okay, this one study says squatting with your knees past your toes, that's bad for your knees. How many other people have conducted a similar study and have found the same thing? Or how many people have conducted the similar study and found completely adverse outcomes? We're not vetting the studies, we're taking the abstracts and conclusions as face value and literally building programs and businesses off of a core single study. I think if we can get to a place of vetting, which is why at the start or, or somewhere in our conversation today, I said, my team welcomes skepticism. I think that's very healthy. Everybody should vet why we're, what makes us different, why we think we can help people. And if we don't have answers that you like, you did a great job vetting. We're, we're not right for you. So I encourage the vetting. Without it, we can't make informed decisions. And it's important to highlight that skepticism out of curiosity not to be skeptical, to be skeptical, because there's also a lot of people out there, right? So I just want to highlight that. Yeah, no no contrarians here. <laughs> <laughs> of course, a couple more things I want to hit you with and learn more about before we wrap up this interview. But yeah, I just want to say I'm having a lot of fun. I am uh, I love the way you view things. You're scientific based enough that you have the right processes in place to help you discern the quality research versus poor research. At the same time, you're very open-minded and you recognize the power of anecdotal evidence because it's evidence nonetheless. Um, yeah, I love the way you, you view things. So this is a personal curiosity on this train. It might be a very short answer, but I still want to ask. Uh, you talked about this prison, imprisonment feeling coming from formal educations. However, you're in a very comfortable spot now. Of course, a lot of your effort now is going towards, of course, raising your son with, uh, with conditions and also prepping for this 1500 mile ultra marathon, which gives me, I just shiver as I just hear that because I'm allergic to cardio. I pay my dues in my military career and I just don't do cardio anymore after I got out. You're, you're probably like how I am to swimming. I'm yeah. done. I'm good. Maybe not, uh, not at elite level, but yeah, I just don't like uh, too, too many rock marches. So you're at a comfortable spot and you're a great business person who operates and runs a seven figure business, which we'll talk about before we wrapped up the episode. And you have helped 4,000 and counting of integrative lives that you've helped right throughout your journey so far. 
as your ability to help scale your impact gets bigger and bigger, has the thought or the conscious thought of, oh, maybe I could pursue more advanced training in whatever specific field so I can even help more people. Has that thought crossed your mind or not really? Yeah, it has. And, and it is an active thought. I'm currently enrolled in two different uh, new curriculums from two different organizations. One is orthopedic medicine exercise expert. And I'm, I'm still, learning is never done. I've developed a method. I've got a successful business. I've not made it though. There is so much still to learn. The more I learn about the body, the more I realize how much I don't know about the body. I don't think I will ever get to a place of feeling satisfied uh, with the knowledge that I have. So it, it is truly an ongoing process of weaving between the student role and the teacher role. When I'm running the business, I'm the teacher, teaching the employees, teaching everybody who's coming to us what they need to know so they can get to a place where I'm at. And then I'll literally, at the end of the day, put back on the student hat. I'll go buy a new textbook, enroll myself in a new program by an accredited organization, and I'll keep learning. So it it never stops. I think how I'm learning and what I'm looking for has changed. It's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, you're a, you're a student of life. And yeah, I feel the same way. I, I used to say, oh, it's all nurture and not nature. Of course, the answer is and, like genetics versus epigenetics. But the more I study about neurobiology, environmental feedback, how DNA expression changes over time based on those feedback, I was like, oh, maybe it is 99% nurturing and 1% genetics. But then on another studies or another research, like, oh, maybe it is 99% genetics and 1% nurture. So I also go back and forth a lot. And I think that's what makes it fun. If you figure everything out about life at age 33, what about the next 50 years? That's <laughs> going to be a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why, of course, we both subscribe to a growth mindset. Not going to talk too much about it because I've talked about this so much in the past three years. But growth mindset by Carol Dweck, it talks about the capacity for growth is innate to every single person. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the reality versus expectations in terms of your business backgrounds and your business acumen in creating Pain Academy with amazing team members. So what's like the reality because I feel like anytime seven big figure business comes up in a headline, people are like, oh, a millionaire. I, I need to know all the shortcuts and successes and blueprints. So what is the reality of running this successful international business versus the expectations of that? Like if you could maybe paint a more realistic picture for the people and through the lens of stress and energy management. First of all, you hit seven figures isn't the first milestone. Five figures is the first milestone. How do I hit $1,000 a month? And you get there and nothing really changes. And then your viewpoint changes to 10,000, 10, 50,000, 100. You, know, you, you have these milestones. So there's nothing that magically changes or happens when these milestones are hit. Nothing. There is no... Uh, seven figures, I've made it, I can breathe. It's just irrelevant numbers that could be key performance indicators that, that show how your systems are working and how successful you are. But you know, my, my expectation was when I thought I'd have a seven figure business, I did it, I can relax now. And the more the business grows, the more work it takes to continue to grow and maintain that growth. It's one thing hitting those numbers. It's an entirely different thing hitting those numbers again and again and again. Talking about the long game here. Nobody wants to make a million dollars in one year and then not make any money for the next 20 years, right? So this is about sustainability. I had some business acumen before I started this business. Uh, before Pain Academy was a thing, I was a regional fitness captain with 24-hour fitness. That meant I got very familiar with profit and loss statements. I got very familiar with how do you run training sections within a gym? How do you make them profitable? What headcount looks like? How do you train people? So there was some basic foundation that I had about business and none of it really applied towards what I do now. What I've had to change along the way when I was starting Pain Academy, what it took to be successful was learning how to change the body. If you came to me with a spinal deformity, if you came to me with muscular imbalance, whatever kind of movement impairment, 
what it took for Pain Academy to be successful is intimately knowing those problems well enough to help you find success. But that's now not my job. The basic information has been learned to help a wide range of people. I've got to learn marketing. I need to learn business management. I need to learn about HR. I am now a corrective exercise expert. That's my first hat. And there's 17 different hats on top of that. I think what is quite different is what's hard is holding on to what makes you passionate. Helping people, connecting with people, celebrating their success, helping them through the obstacles. That happens less the more people we help. Because when this business hits scale, there's so many more things that need to happen to sustain this growth and help the business grow that you kind of get disconnected from what made you get into this in the first place. And it is a It's something I ask my team literally on every weekly call, send me the success stories. When you get a great email, send it to me. When you not get a great email, send it to me. I want to be connected to the business because I'm no longer in the trenches. For the first couple of years, I was working in the business and I had such an intimate pulse with everybody that was in this program working through this that as we've come to scale, you can't have intimate connections with 4,000 people. And those are just lives changed. We've had more people in the program too. There is a level of your expertise that needs to change as the business grows. And I think it is vital and imperative to avoid burnout, to remind yourself every single day why you started and to have some part of your day factored into that, whether it's community outreach, reaching out to new members, uh, uh, asking for testimonials so you can look at the results, analyzing the photos, the art and the science, the stuff that makes you originally do what you wanted to do. You've got to keep that passion alive. Otherwise, it turns into a passionless business. Yeah, I think that's a common struggle that a lot of influencers and successful entrepreneurs I've had on the show is they go through the trenches of turning passion to profit. But then that prophesization of that passion, you lose some oomph factor in terms of what made you fall in love with that process to begin with. Uh, and it's a very tricky balance. And of course, another quote, another cliche, new levels, new devils. But that is so true. Of course, the, the scale of my podcast is not the same as you. I only have one team member who's a video editor. Hi, Sam. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> even doing that, I realize I have to do so much into SEO, marketing, branding, and other things that's not really podcasting. Like these three hours, two and a half hours that I have a few times a week, I love and I die for these moments because it's a real life grounding mechanism to help ground me that, oh, this is what you started this for. And But at the same time, you want to scale your impact because you want to reach more people. And that level of external validation feels nice. Anyone who says I need no external validations are lying. It's human nature. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I relate deeply to what you said. And, and I, for the longest time, so it took me about six years of going through such a extensive list of modalities to try to move and feel better until finally come up, coming across the information that I now teach others to, to serve them. I was very angry when I first came across this information because it was never recommended. We're talking about total body, functional morphology, movement, alignment, balance, all these things that these principles that the body depends on to thrive and move and feel good. I was angry that this stuff wasn't mainstream. It felt foo-foo because nobody had heard of it. Nobody had heard, I for sure hadn't heard of this deep into the trenches. And when I talked about it, nobody had heard about these core concepts and principles. By the time I came across this information, I had multiple certifications in health and wellness and fitness uh, industry. Still, this information was not ever presented, not even the basic principles of it. And for the longest time, I I was frustrated. Why isn't this stuff mainstream? Why isn't it out there? And now that my business has scaled, I I think I understand why. Because the people who know what I know and the people who are helping people out there and the capacity that I'm doing, the business passion isn't there. Or they got to a point where it could have caught on, but it quickly became not about what got them into this business. And they've closed They close the scalable business and focus on the in-person practice. If you're a body worker and you're passionate about that, scale is not for you. 
or if it is, you're you're going to have to really fight every day to make sure you remind yourself why you're doing what it is that you're doing. And I think running a business on the scale that we're running now, it's it's just clear to me why this information is not the first information that's being presented in rehabilitation or prehab options. And what listeners could take away from your story, Vinny, is that you you recognize this phenomenon of the great possibility that some parts of your initial love and this dire need to help people, addiction to help people, might subside a little bit. That's why you created an internal system, like asking your team members to send you uh, gratifying emails or non-gratifying emails, and you have this system in place to help ground you. Because I think grounding takes a village a lot of times, especially if you cannot be self-accountable for everything. And as I said, as you scale up, you are going to make some trade-offs, which is another shining topic throughout this episode, right? Yeah, the the numbers, the profit and loss statements, it's it's that's not gratifying for me. Uh, it's nice. It means I get to go help support team members, and it means we're helping a lot of people. So there's there's some gratifying metrics to it, but it's very far removed from what my true purpose and passion and calling is. And I had to learn the hard way through five different failed business partnerships along the way of where's my passion? What am I good at? What are the things that nobody else can do that I feel like I can do well? And stop trying to be kind of okay at something else. I'll I'll give you an example. Website design. I don't know a thing about a website. You bring me a spine, I'm going to show you how to restore normal S curvature. You tell me to design a homepage. I don't know how to do that. Yet I was spending hours and hours and hours each day and every week and month tweaking a website. Why am I a corrective exercise, somebody who's gifted and talented at working and helping people change their life? Why am I fumbling around with a website? Learning how to offshore those things to somebody out there who can do to a website what I can help do to somebody's body, that's what it's going to take to be successful. You've got to build your team around you of people who are incredibly better at doing so many things that you can't do. That's what it takes. And it goes back to asking for help. That was really hard. And giving some of that responsibility to somebody else, trusting somebody else to make marketing messages and websites and to to communicate your vision for you. That's what it ultimately takes is is learning how to trust others to do these jobs. And that was very hard for, for the first couple of years. I lost count how many cliches I'm about to share, but another common business saying is whatever problems can be solved by money, solve it. Because that's all you <laughs> when <laughs> I'm digging that too. This is it's actually the most counterintuitive but most optimal thing you can do because for you to be even at that fork in a crossroad to debating and calculating the loss and gains in terms of scaling, you already have the skill sets to create some sort of a business on a smaller scale, sure. So it literally makes sense to offshore, as you said, as much things that is not your lanes of genius and double down, triple down what you're good at. That's how you scale. Um, But it's not as easy as it is said because for someone to get to this far like you, surrendering and relinquishing control is probably some of the hardest things you you would have to do. Yeah, it's it's incredibly challenging. Yeah, so I have another follow-up question to this. Uh, it might be a short answer, it might not. I have a lot of very, very successful business friends in LA, right? Um, this person, his name is Jonathan. He was on the guest recently. He runs a real estate mortgage loan company. It's ranked 14th in the nation, and their portfolio is about $250 million. That's their portfolio. He's 27, younger. He's incredibly successful. Yet he is working, he loves what he does, but he's constantly and incessantly stressed. So I asked them one day, I said, Jonathan, are you more stressed now or during the come up? Now as in he made it, he is special name, he's on every news article as possible. Likewise, Vinny, are you more stressed now that your scaling has hit this international seven figure level or were you more stressed in terms of when you're actually in the come up in the trenches trying to get to this exact point that you can only dreamt of a while ago? It's a great question. I think it's not as simple as a yes or no because the stress levels change completely. When Pain Academy was started, the only way that this business could stay in business is if I was servicing sessions. When we were 
in and out of hospitals for the first couple of years of my son's life. The business wasn't growing. How could it? If I'm not there to service the business, there is no business. So my time was the direct stress because I had to trade time for money. The benefit of that was if I had time to give, we could make money very fast. I knew how to talk to people and I knew how to grow a one-on-one business very fast because there's a lot of people that need help. They're just looking for somebody who can offer that help. As the business grew and it became less dependent on Vinny trading time for money and it became about developing the system that creates the change, the stress level changed because now I'm not trading time for money, I'm trading systems for money. So now it's if we need to go cover payroll or if something needs to happen, it's not like I can call up XYZ and client or respond to text messages and book appointments and develop an immediate cash stream. It's looking at the ecosystem of a very well-established business year, uh, a business on its seventh year. We're talking a lot of people in our ecosystem, a lot of different variables and, and systems what one thing needs to be tweaked here and how is that going to have an impact? It's becoming more of a scientist on your own process, not changing too many things at once because then if something works, you have no idea what you did. If you break it, you have no idea what just broke. If it works, you have no idea how to continue those successes. So it's learning how to be much more patient and that's very stressful because your success is not in your hands anymore. It's in this abstract system. You can't hold it. You can't touch it. You can't really do anything to it without a a potentially catastrophic outcome and learning how to trust that system that it has your back and you poured everything into this thing and it's doing exactly what it needs to. It's a different level of stress knowing that there's six people who fundamentally depend on me for a living. And it's not, if my own business, one-on-one business failed, I'd fail myself and I'd fail my immediate family close to me, they would suffer those consequences. But now six other selves and their families and their, you know, it's an an ecosystem. So it's a much bigger thing now that it feels more successful because I'm not trading time for money anymore, but the stress has just risen with it. And that really ties nicely to nothing magically changes because it hits seven figures. You're not on easy street where you get a sit back in a recliner. If anything, the stakes get greater. You know, you're, if you're having that kind of revenue, your expenses are also quite significant. The money that you once thought was a great paycheck, you're spending that in two days trying to support your staff and team. The numbers completely change at scale and so does the business. So, uh, I've noticed me prioritizing my own mental health and my own physical health more the larger the business gets so I can show up as consistently as stable of a leader as I can be so the team can have as stable of a job as they can have. Yeah, you saw me smiling throughout your response because that's a similar response given by my friends and many high caliber amazing business people on the show. And that's what I meant by I wanted you to portray a more realistic picture. Because for any listeners that made it to this end, I feel like they deserve a sneak peek and this eons of truth that it's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off and it's always and. So that's why I don't know why we're so prone to just or, A or B, A or C. It's like, no, scaling comes as great successes, but that great successes comes with a lot of downsides and trade-offs. Uh, but like I said, new levels, new devils, right? I had a a business coach, one of the early on mentors, because again, I'm running a business where there's smoke, there is fire. It was starting to work. People in different countries are hearing about us. I thought it would be appropriate to get a business coach. And so I looked at business coaches who were running scalable businesses so they could teach me about it. And I remember this first business coach I had without without sharing who they were, they sent me their revenue reports. Vinny, I'm going to be a great coach. Look at how many figures I'm making. And I was really razzled and dazzled by this. This person's where I want to be. Once we got a little deeper into our coaching relationship and I felt like there was some trust and and connection, I had asked for the P&Ls because I want to see how they run their business. With over $2 million in sales, their profit was about $25,000. 
you got to work really hard to make $2 million in sales and it's not worth $25,000 in profits. And it was this instantaneous moment of realizing I got sucked into what this grind Instagram social media culture is, is everybody's showing figures and top line revenue. They're not showing what the take home is. That was the disconnect. So as I talk about a seven figure business, it's great, but that's the top line of the business. And people who want to scale and grow to multiple figures, you've got to understand that's the top line. There's a whole other aspect of the business that you need to understand. Who cares if you make a million dollars if you're only keeping 20,000 of it? That means nothing. You could go get a part-time job and make $20,000 a year and not have the stress of having a multi-million dollar business. You know, It just depends on how you run it. And, and these are the lessons that you will learn when you get there. And to the listeners, sure as I'm going to connect everything we just talked about, since it's not a business podcast, of course, is the way I view what Vinny just said is once again, going full circle into these incremental practices, whether it's through learning about movements or mobilities or pain management through Vinny's pain academy or seeing a therapist or whatever, they're always trading off one for the other. So wouldn't you want to sacrifice some activities or habits that you're doing that consumes a large amount of energy expenditures, but that's yielding little ROIs or returns on investment. You want to replace those habits and activities into something that's going to give you higher yields of return. And that's the best way to change your life without changing every single thing about your life because that takes time, right? Um, and I feel like that's like a large pillar is you want to focus on the largest traffic cones or pillars of your life and to see what can I do about replacing this one habit and how much can they improve my life in the way I want to, which is a 2% and the 98% uh, quote we talked about with Emily Fletcher. But I appreciate your insights and I, I, I'm, my, I'm trying my best to sprinkle as much nuances as I can in this current era of death of nuances because people just cling on into something shiny, like the shiny squirrels of the internet and they forget about everything else. It's like, no. It's ants and there's something else on the other side as well. Yeah. We're definitely coming towards the end of the episode, Vinny. And before I hit you with the red carpet moment and also hit you with the signature discover more question, I want to talk about something with you that we briefly talked about in our last conversations. And I talked about the biggest struggle and stress, stress point in your current life right now, aside from the ultra marathon prep, is that you pigeoned yourself into this pain academy whole. Because Pain Academy is a great trademark, great name. I love it very much because it's self-explanatory. At the same time, even your mission statements on your website is about for people dealing with chronic pain, nagging injuries, or people who cannot move the way they want it to be. So that portrays this lens of, oh, if you only have acute and chronic pain, then you can benefit from Venice Brands. Um, for anyone that made it to this far, uh, could you share your what exact is your holistic approach to healing and pain management and everything in between and why people who don't necessarily have acute or chronic pain can also benefit from uh, listening or checking out your uh, brand and um, all thing you have to offer on Pain Academy website? Yeah, I'd love to. So Pain Academy, I thought was a great name because it meets people probably on where they're at. However, it it's disheartening when people reach out and say, do I have to break my back to do your program? You know, do, do I have to have massive movement impairments to just learn your movements and feel better? And the answer is no. I think this program is obviously very great at taking people from disability to living a life with capacity again, but it really shines in the long game when the body becomes healthy and mobile and stable and things really start working well, it just reinforces and maintains our body structure long term. So you don't need to be in pain to do Pain Academy. You just have to be somebody who wants to learn about your body, get a little bit of education, not academic textbook, but what are you doing? What happens to your body when you move? And where are the areas of opportunity? What could be improved? And if you want to start developing a movement practice that serves you, one that you can rely on on a daily basis of knowing which exercises to do, which routines to do that just 
help make you move and feel a little better than you were at the start of the day. I think about movement on a scale of one to 10. Your 10s are the athletes, mobile, stable, strong, functional, no pain. People who are probably one are about where I was at. Living life with disability, very painful. You can enter a movement practice, the one that I teach on any point in that scale, but specifically what this program is designed for, what my process and methodology is about is restoring muscular function. So in balances from right to left, getting each joint to understand how that joint should be able to move according to its design. You don't need to be in pain to have muscle imbalances. You don't need to be in pain to have a hip that doesn't really move or feel like the other hip. This program's great if you just feel like your movement is off or you just feel like you're kind of starved of motion. The whole point of this program is to slowly and systemically help your body rediscover motion. We at at a young age had an insanely incredible capacity for movement. Without the help of coaches or expensive trainers, go look at a kid's squat. It's nearly perfect. Now the argument is, is, well, that kid's femurs aren't fully developed. No, it's that the kid is pliable and mobile. And if you watch a kid move, they have such a high capacity of movement that they can move so well. Well, as we age, we lose this capacity of motion because we aren't doing well-rounded movements. There's the routines we do. There's the workouts we do. I think you, if you've ever been in a gym, you've probably heard of the guy who skips leg day. He doesn't skip it because he needs to skip it. He skips it because he wants to. We choose activities and hobbies and interests based on things that we want to do, but this doesn't really give us a well-rounded nervous system. We become adapted and specialized in doing those things. What my program offers is a way back to becoming unspecialized at getting our body to move in versatile ways again. It is about reminding the larger muscle groups how to do their work. It is about restoring motion in each part of your body So when it comes time to move and do bigger motions, like walking, running, bending forward, anything, any activity, your body possesses that capacity to move. So it's a process. It's not a, you know, it's it's a year long program. This is why it's not a, let's fix your back pain in 30 days. It's let's show you how to integrate motion back into your world. Yeah, that's amazing. The, um, I wanted to end the episode on a specific note as because I know that your program is more encompassing as what it may seem from the outside. And of course, that's the discernment, that's the vetting, that's the power of research that we talked about. We are simply the vehicles of resources. And of course, Vinny is an expert on corrective exercise science. And I think it's only right before I roll out the red carpet for you and hit you with the question of discover more. I wanted to end that segment with another quote by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. He talks about life is comprised of what repeats. So get those repeated things right. And that statement and quote applies to your mental health habits and your physical health habits. And like what Vinny alluded to, this entirety of very encompassing and insightful conversations, get the little habits right. And you'll be amazed like your uh, Samantha story on the 14th month. After 13 months of stagnancy, air quote, on the 14th month, you're like, whoa. That came, that came out of nowhere. No, it didn't come out of nowhere. It came out from you by working and tweaking and refining that little things because that little things will be repeated and become automatic part of who we are. It's just a matter of if, I'm sorry, it's, it's a matter of when, not if, when you focus on the process and the little habits. I think we're all really addicted to those macro, those big changes, but we don't see it's the little micro changes every day that lead up to those macro changes. And if we can look at the micro habits, doing these little movements every day, spending some time for your mental health, the compounding effect it has, hopefully short-term, that'd be great, but definitely long-term is incredible. Yeah, because macro is comprised of micros, period. Um, Yeah, before I share more cliches and quotes, I wanted to uh, roll out the red carpet for you and then I want to wrap up the episode with the discover more questions yeah this is where i roll out the red carpet for you Vinny. where could people check out your website your brands where can they book you check out this new application transitional process you're going through concurrently speaking and where could they just connect further and ask whatever they want to ask probably the best place is first instagram 
at Pain Academy. This is where I do long form captions. The majority of our content lives on that, that social platform. The second place is our website. So www.painacademy.net. We have our programs available for sale. You're gonna notice that we do not sell access to our movement program right at the start. There is a step one, which is called the pain assessment toolkit. Let's see if we're a good fit first through six different assessments. I'm gonna teach you about your body, what's happening, what you're moving and feeling, everything that you need to know to get your bearings about what we do and how we can help you. And then from there, if you feel like we're a good fit, then you can get involved in our movement program, which is the year long course that I fundamentally believe will change your life if you're ready to make a commitment. And Samantha plus 4,000 other clients, of course, agree with that statement as well. Um, yeah, so to conclude this amazing conversation, I, I learned a lot and I had a lot of fun in this time. Um, with this insightful conversations, the question serves twofold, Vinny. First fold is, what is an area in your life or domain that you want to discover more about after this insightful conversations? The second fold is, what is an area in our listeners' lives or even your audience that you want to encourage them or even to challenge them to discover more about after this episode with you? The area of my life that I want to discover more about is discipline. It's personal discipline to be okay not having to, and it might sound silly, but train so hard, give everything always 100% to find this kind of softer side of living life. I think there's a time and a place for intensity and there's a time and a place for softness. I have spent the past 13 years of my life in that soft place of doing kind of like that bare minimum, what, what's just enough to get through. And as I'm learning these harder forms of training, I want to find this middle ground. I've been an all or nothing kind of guy, very black and white. I want to become more proficient at how to live in the gray, how to live in the and, not live in the or. We either train really hard or we don't train at all today. I want to know what a light run feels like uh, doing a movement that that is more enriching than taxing. That's the space that I want to get better at is developing the discipline to live in that gray area a little bit better and to stop uh, polarize a little less. My invitation for everybody listening is I think everybody wants to move better. Everybody wants to do really cool things that serve them that look great. My invitation is to first practice stillness, which I wanna show you how to do. If you wanna evolve your movement, if you wanna evolve your, evolve your capacity for your body to do really cool things, it first starts with you learning how to do the simple things, the stillness, how to move, do the gentlest and simplest of motions. If I can invite you on how to learn those and master those, you're gonna watch how the big stuff becomes more and more avail available for you. Yeah, and also if you find a test-proof way to find that off-white gray area with your life, because I'm I'm very big on nuances because I'm also very extreme, right? So like when I want to turn my brain off, I just smoke a lot of weed and just shut down, or I work 14, 15 hour days. So <laughs> when you find that off-white gray area, please also let me know because I also need to better my balance. And of course, balance looks different for everyone. Um, yeah, man, this is an amazing conversation. And um, yeah, to wrap up the question, I guess uh, we talked a lot about things and we talked a lot of topics. Do you have any uh, parting messages for the listeners to take away um, after your encouragement, your invitation to discover more about? Well, the, the central message is, I don't know you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what hand you've been dealt in life. I promise you that you're stronger than you think. Your body is ingenious. It is capable of doing incredible things. And if you want to learn how to tap into that, I'd love to show you how to do that. But re really truly believe that your body can do whatever you want it to do. Yeah. Never underestimate your capacity for change because you have it. We have it. Vinny has it. He's proven it. And so do you. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the end for today's episode. And to all the listeners, as always, infinite gratitude for your attention and your time and visiting us every single week because we know everyone and their mothers have podcasts nowadays. Um, and as always, I hate to do this, but about 75% of the viewers on YouTube are not subscribed yet. So please hit that subscribe, like, and share this with one person if you found any value in our conversations. If you didn't, don't share. But if you did, it will motivate me to keep this unmonetized by keeping this as pure as I possibly could to provide you with maximum 
values with no strings attached. With that, I will include all the shell notes in the episode descriptions. I'll link all of Vinny's information below, and you can always do more discovering more of your own after the podcast. And as always, I will see you again next week on this next trains of discover more. And thank you for listening.